So now that uh, here we are in the post-global financial crisis era and we're, we're toggling from the rulemaking phase to more of the implementation phase, we're starting to notice some shifts in demographics, market demographics around risk analytics now that there's much more clarity in the landscape. And we're, we're really fortunate today. We've got Brad Ziff from MISIS, a senior risk advisor at MISIS. I really wanted to launch you into this conversation. I know that there's it's, it's fruitful territory to talk about um, what's changing on the buy side and maybe some of the smaller sell side players that look like buy side players and, and they're changing appetites for these new kinds of capabilities. So why don't we start there, Brad? That's a great place to start. Uh, there's no question that I think what we're seeing in the developed markets, uh, starting in the United States, second in the EU, EC, London, and I would say tertiary in Asia, yeah. is certainly a shift of risk out of some of the major sell-side participants to buy-side participants. Right. It's driven heavily by two components, a lot of capital guidelines as well as compliance guidelines right. that have restricted the use of over-the-counter derivatives or have shifted them into something that will not allow them to make the profits that they have before and reduce their proprietary trading. What's happened is that you're beginning to see private equity firms, mm -hmm. some asset managers, clearly it's happening in real estate and also yeah. with REITs, of course, it's happening amongst the hedge fund and the leverage fund community, broadly speaking, non-bank financial institutions who are stepping into that role and slowly picking up pieces of that risk. Is another way of saying this that in, you know, if we use this dividing line of the past five years that there used to be a much heavier dependence on intermediaries. And of course, when you had the leverage knob that you could just dial up over and over and over again, you didn't have to be as um, sensitive to uh, certain kind of capital allocations. Is that another way of saying I used to depend on my broker or the prime broker, and now I need to be much more independent in my ability to assess their risk, my risk, your risk? Is that the, the story? I think that's among the stories. It's okay. not the only story. Yeah. So it's certainly true that buy-side participants, even if you add to that list, for example, sovereigns and insurance companies and pension funds, uh, wealth advisors, just even to that longer list that I had before, they're all looking at the credit risk and their exposure to the sell side with a much higher level of scrutiny than they did before. But that began about four and a half or five or six years ago, even pre the crisis, as they were much more sensitive to this. Yeah. I think the driver amongst this is that as investors are looking for a better return on the allocations yeah. that they're giving, yeah. the buy side sees an opportunity to diversify their risks into much more international holdings, into more diverse holdings, which allow them to take on risk, to diversify it, to extend their expertise and to play roles that they didn't have in the past. So a more global appetite for risk and diversity of risk taking is another primary driver of an increased appetite to have better analytics. Uh, that absolutely, because that they obviously in their role are going to have to build everything, the risk culture, yeah. the risk appetite yeah. at the process level. They're going to have to build compliance, and they're going to have to build the analytics, which is the software, the technology, and the resources to commit themselves to manage those new risks. You know, as we were talking kind of as the prep to this and you telling all the stories of traveling to a lot of different new, some of them developing and emerging markets, it, it occurs to me that you know, as we follow the, the regulatory reform narrative in the G20, right, and the G20 commitments and how uh, the U.S. has led and the U.K. And, and Europe is close behind. We just did some work on, on Japan and how they're tracking closely, but they're still two or three years out. But then there's this, it, you know, outside of the G20, is there a different timeline? You talk about you know, the Middle East, you talk about South America, can they move at a different pace or develop capabilities at a different pace than the G20 that's locked into those commitments? Well, I think it's not they can, they will. Yeah. So I think the regulators are doing a couple of things yeah. in a lot of the emerging markets. They are not necessarily lowering the requirements 
for those institutions as compared to what the BIS or the G7, 10, or 20 are doing. But what they're doing is somewhat lengthening the timeline in which you get to accommodate those yeah. requirements. Yeah. I think the second thing that's happening is that those particular institutions are having, I think, less tortured co conversations with their central bankers. One of the things I've noticed as I've spoken at a number of the MISIS conferences is that there's always a central banker who precedes me on the platform yeah. and who talks to the audience about what yeah. they're looking to do, yeah. and that dialogue is constructive. Right. So I was very surprised, for example, that when I was in Bangladesh, in right. Dhaka, there were 60 or 75 people in that room, and there was a very, very interesting back and forth with the head of the central bank. Yeah. I saw the same thing in Beirut yeah. when I was there, and I anticipate seeing the same thing when I go to Africa. I certainly saw it in Latin America when I was in Mexico City. I think those opportunities are, let's talk about this to make sure that we do the sensible things because we don't need to be punitive because right. our banks have not, by and large, really gone above and beyond what they need to. Are you traveling through the alphabet? Because I've heard Angola, Beirut, Bangladesh. So um, I have not had Zambia bick, uh, you know, booked for me as of yet, so I'm not <laughs> sure what that will happen. I, got, I have one question, and, and again, it's a twist on our, on our prior conversation. Take um, technical innovation and social media and, the, and crowdfunding and the idea that some traditional roles of, int of intermediaries are at risk or in the process of being disintermediated purely by new flows of data, new flows of interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. And then couple that with the shifting of capabilities from the sell side to the buy side and maybe some more peripheral players, regional players, smaller players. Do you see, you know, I, I have a theory that some of the, that we're going to go back to the 70s in the way that some of these private partnerships, prop shops, hedge funds, will regain some of the functionality that used to exist in the capital markets before it turned into a supermarket. Do you see it that way? Well, you I, see it? I think that we'll play some of that yeah. role. So part of it is certainly on the technology and the software side. Yeah. We're not uh, certainly immune from not having to understand the role of the cloud. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. will certainly appreciate the fact that the mid-sized firms are going to look for a far more cost-effective, much more efficient, a better way of communicating with their yeah. clients. Yeah. As you begin to see what you're referring to as disintermediation, and I think that's a friend but accurate term for seeing the role of the buy side and things like funding yeah. and coming in with balance sheet yeah. and uh, structuring and securitizing yeah. assets. Yeah. As you begin to see that, one of the things you know is it's their assets. It yeah. does not belong to anybody else but themselves and the shareholders, i.e. the investors. Right. There is no such thing as overhead in those places. So they're looking for the most efficient yeah. and the most customized response. They do not want something that's right off the shelf. Is there, I mean, I, I lied, okay, one small final tag along here. Is, is there some timing to this? I mean, is there several years of bulking up capabilities and then you see this flow of you know, new shingles being held out or new capabili capabilities being advertised, or is it sooner than that? So I think of all the things you've asked, that may be the most interesting, but I'll try to come up with a short answer. <laughs> I think the thing that's most interesting yeah. about this process yeah. is that people are very used to concentration of risk yeah. amongst the banks. Yeah. What they're going to need to become far more wise to, wiser to, tolerant of yeah. and understanding is that this risk will be very diversified. Yeah. So you're not going to be able to establish that in two years hedge funds will do X, private equity right. firms will do Y, um, or what is going to happen with the real estate market in the U.S. What you can figure out is that we have a half trillion plus reed industry in the U.S. It's now a reed industry in Korea. There's a reed industry in Mexico. Yeah. So as you begin to see the growth globally, more assets will be get, will begun to be shifted off to different players in the market, some of whom can be globally dominant yeah. and others of whom will actually be local. Yeah. It'll be that diversification that people will have to look at yeah. to manage risk. Well, this is uh, probably more than we expected to give to our audience today in this in this video to, to absorb, but we'll give you a chance to absorb it. We'll bookmark it there. Brad, I'm I'm grateful for your for this conversation and this topic and hope to have you back to talk further about 
about risk and, and uh, the changing landscape. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for watching.